Trevor and Megan had been together for six years by the time she got the invite to go to Toronto to be on Suits. Now, like we said last time, Megan was none too sad about going to Toronto. Mm -mm. She was all about making her new home in Toronto. She can't wait to leave Trevor and have an excuse to be free of that. Like, you've gotten me in everywhere that I could go, you've taken me there, and it hasn't been far, so I'm ready to go and sow my wild oats someplace else. Um, Trevor, inexplicably, was trying desperately to hold on to this relationship. He didn't want it to go. He was not thrilled with the idea of Megan moving to Toronto, but this was her goal, this was her dream, and he had his own goals, dreams, and ambitions. And, you know, he wasn't going to trample on hers, but he thought that the best way to secure this relationship so that it would survive the Toronto move was to get engaged. So six years into their relationship, they went to Belize for a holiday, and soon after they arrived, he proposed. Now this whole marriage, y'all is wild i'm talking bananas wait till we get to the wedding it's like this i think the thing that shocked me the most was how calculating she was at this stage of the game so this early on before they're even married girls minds taken okay so bear that in mind all right so they get engaged um but neither one of them are thinking that they should possibly be living together during these first couple years of marriage. You know, it's like, let's get married, but live together. <laughs> Crazy. And so they get engaged. Megan is supposedly thrilled that, you know, finally she secured that diamond, you know? And I think for her, that was like game over, I won. You know, like she didn't want the marriage part, <laughs> boring. She wanted to know, I won, I got the diamond, okay? And once you've done that, you know, you, you, you've made a guy want you enough that he wants you for life, okay, I'm done. The game's not fun anymore. And so she, she wants the wedding though, okay? She wanted the diamond, she wants the wedding, she don't want the man. And she does a really great job of hiding this, though, from the people who are in her life. They don't realize right now. It's all in hindsight that we'll see. She gets engaged. She calls her friend Nanaki Pretty. She's ecstatic. Now, Nanaki, by the way, was all Team Trevor this whole time, okay? Let that not go by the wayside. She thought that, and she really thought this was like the love story of the century, Megan and and Trevor. And I, 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 I don't think that Nanaki was naive. I don't think that she was had like no ability to read people, but we're gonna see a significant shift in who Megan is with her friends and family in this chapter. So Nanaki, as far as she could see it, saw two people who loved each other, who were rooting for each other, who were really supportive of each other's careers. And she thought that this was um, a beautiful union and she was super excited for Megan because she'd known that Megan wanted to be married like their entire life Megan's big goal was to be married even when they're little girls she just wanted to get married Megan comes back to LA shows Nanaki the ring they're crying they're holding each other they're so excited Megan asks Nanaki to be her maid of honor Megan's like I can't wait um, to be married and I want to have children with this man and he is it for me like the stars have aligned. Um, so this is the last Nanaki knew of it. Um, all right, so now it's time for her to get married. She can't put it off any longer. They were gonna get married in Jamaica in September, 2011. It would appear Tom Bauer puts this little aside in right before he starts talking about the wedding. Now, I love this book because it is filled with a lot of facts. But sometimes I do think that Tom Bauer tries to make a point and it, sometimes it's just not super clear what it is he's saying. Like I get what he's saying, but I don't know why he's so, so oblique about it. This passage is about how Trevor looked at Megan and essentially thought that she was maybe a little better than him, um, certainly more together and professional than him. And so he looked at, at being with her as kind of a leg up. Where have we heard this before? 
This is exactly Harry's impression of Meghan, that she's better than him. She's a really great way of making men feel that they have somehow, despite the fact that she's a nightmare to live with, somehow there is some kind of status in being involved with her. Because, you know, she's professional. I don't know. But anyway, this is what Trevor writes, or this is what Bauer writes about Trevor. He says, three weeks before the big party, the Schmoes Know, which was a live po podcast by Trevor with two friends, highlighted the difference between him and Megan. Swigging from a hip flask, Trevor described how he feared a splash on his suit while using a urinal. One of his friends suggested that Megan be invited to appear on their podcast. She's a big deal, fuck off, snapped Trevor. Casual, earthy, untidy, and unpunctual, Trevor knew he was marrying a self-disciplined perfectionist. Okay, so that is such a classic Tom Bauer passage. Sometimes he just quotes things without really putting them in context for us. I mean, or if he does, it's vague or oblique. Um, and I guess he just figures, you know, we're not little kids. We can figure out what, what he's saying. But sometimes I wish he would just be a little bit more specific about some of his quotations. Anyway, that's an aside. All right, now this is super, super important. Okay, they're getting married in Jamaica. No, that's just a big party, okay? They actually got married in Los Angeles in a civil ceremony. Listen carefully. Trevor and Megan married on 16th August in a civil ceremony in Los Angeles. Neither Thomas nor Doria were invited and the date was deliberately classified as confidential by the couple to prevent outsiders without a court order discovering the details. First of all, neither she nor Trevor is famous enough for anybody to care that they're getting married. No one's rushing to the wedding. No one's trying to, you know, crash their, their wedding. There's not gonna be helicopters flying over. Nobody cares if Trevor Engelson marries Meghan Markle. Nobody. So for them to have, be all cloak and dagger about this says one thing and one thing only to me. She had no intention of this marriage lasting and she wanted it to be a footnote in her biography that she had ever known Trevor. And so for her to be all secretive and you know, seal off the court documents and let's get married in this quiet little civil ceremony. And then wait till we get to the wedding. Wait for her behavior at the wedding. This girl didn't want anyone to know she'd ever been married, ever. I mean, she had bigger fish to fry than to be married to Trevor Engelson. So again, I go back to, she wanted the victory. She wanted the win of that diamond ring and she wanted to have a wedding. She wanted to have a big party. That is the only reason that she said yes to the proposal because it was like the, the crowning victory on this, you know, catch of hers. Okay, so there was a total of 102 guests at this wedding. <clears throat> Again, it was a destination wedding. It was in Jamaica. Megan booked all 55 rooms and villas, but she didn't pay for them. Guests who came to the wedding paid for their own accommodations. Um, obviously they paid for their own fare to get there. Thomas, for his part, contributed $20,000 to the cost of this wedding. He says they didn't expect the money, but it was his daughter and he wanted to set her up right, which was very generous of him because Megan had enough money of her own to pay for this wedding. Um, he had to sell some, some shares in order to get that money, but he was willing to do it. In return, Megan and Trevor gave him a certificate for a journey anywhere in the world. Um, and not a ticket, mind you, a certificate. So I don't know if this was like some sort of homemade calligraphy job of hers where she like wrote him out this thing. It was like, anywhere you want to fly in the world, daddy, I'll send you there. It's like whoever really cashes those in because it's a non-gift. Anyway, um, most of Doria's family did not come to the wedding. And Thomas thinks it's probably because they couldn't afford to, to fly there and then also pay to stay at um, the Jamaica Inn, which is a really famous hotel so I mean it's not like you know let's all go get rooms at the Holiday Inn I mean it, it was pricey um, Samantha also was not able to go um, because at this point her multiple scler sclerosis had put her in a wheelchair so it wasn't a journey she could take but she did send her daughter some of the couple's friends were able to come there was a large contingent of from the cast of suits really she was universally loved on that set most people thought she was great um, they felt that she was empathetic. Again, her professionalism really won her a lot of stars. And this is the thing. We work in, we, we, we live in an age in which laziness reigns supreme. 
So you only have to be marginally professional for people to think that you really are the bomb.com. Well, I mean, that's what I tell my kids all the time. You just show up and do the work and you, by, by, by your simple consistency, people will view you as being way more with it than you maybe possibly are because there's so many other people who are just lazing around, playing on their phones, goofing off, that if you can just show yourself to be adequate whatsoever, you'll shine like the greatest beacon known to man. Well, I think Megan had realized that if she was professional, people would equate that with a skill level she did not have. But anyway, she managed to pull the wool over numbers of people's eyes. So a lot of people came to her wedding excited, ready to support her. Okay, well, things kind of start going off the rails at this wedding as far as Thomas's awareness that Megan is reconstructing a whole new version of life events. The night before the wedding ceremony, Trevor described in his speech during the dinner, this book that he had prepared for him and Megan's lives. In the book's conclusion, said Trevor, was his pledge to give Megan the quote, family home she'd never had. Thomas and Doria exchanged looks of absolute incredulity. What are you saying right now? The home life she's never had. What love and affection have we withheld from this girl? Everything she's ever wanted, we've made sure that it happened. Yes, we were divorced, but nobody was out on the street. No, there was no bitter custody battle fights. We've always gotten along. We've always gone on vacations together. We have made the separation as amicable as it is possible to have a separation. So what has she, what has she possibly told Trevor? That's what Thomas wanted to know. She'd had two good families and all the love and attention any child could want. And both of them just wondered what Megan had told Trevor about her childhood. What had she concealed about her past? Why had she distorted her origins? And what quote unquote secrets did Trevor now have about Megan's upbringing? You know, what revelations had she revealed to him in quiet moments? Thomas began to be really nervous and scared at this point because he thought, all right, I'm already sensing a cooling in my relationship with Megan. Every time we talk on the phone, she's talking down to me. And now I find out she's telling her husband all these stories about me that are not true or, or, or at least alluding to uh, like a, a, a sad, unloved childhood. Um, you know, is this the beginning of the end for me and for Megan? Is, is, is my daughter, am I losing my daughter? Because she's compiled this whole new story of life. Now we're going to get into the part that I alluded to earlier about her not wanting proof of this wedding. Okay. She had those guests on a super strict itinerary about what they were doing the entire time. And Thomas says that she controlled that wedding like a sergeant. He said that there were times when everyone was to be ready in costumes. There was time when everybody was supposed to be playing games, time when everybody needed to eat together. And he couldn't understand what she was trying to achieve here. And one of the things that she did that he couldn't understand whatsoever is she forbid people to take photos. Um, despite her instructions though, her dad who loved to take pictures was not about to listen to this ridiculous edict and he went ahead and took pictures if he wanted to. Um, he went ahead and snapped photos because it was his beloved daughter. She was getting married. He wasn't going to let this moment go undocumented. He had documented like far less exciting or interesting moments. So as if Thomas Markle wasn't going to show up with a camera. Nanaki Pretty said that she just cried um, the moment that she saw Megan in her dress, that M Meg literally shone with happiness. She said they'd been just like sisters since they were two years old. And to see Megan getting married was such a big deal for her, for Megan. It was just extremely, it was such an extremely moving wedding and it was so beautiful to watch. She said that they loved each other so much that in Nanaki's estimation, Megan had married her eternal love. So I don't know what Megan was telling to Nanaki because Nanaki has a whole nother version of how much Megan loved Trevor that I, we are not seeing. But Nanaki believes like this was like the, like the marriage of, of the millennium, the, the love story to end all love stories. I mean, she goes on and on about it in the book. I mean, I, I've skimmed over how much she was into the idea of Megan and Trevor. She was more into that relationship than either one of them. Definitely more into the relationship than Megan was. Okay. Now it's important to note that Though Thomas was fine with Megan marrying Trevor, Trevor's parents weren't real into Megan. They have this ceremony that's sort of Jewish, this sort of Jewish wedding ceremony. You know, they stand under the chupa and, you know, they step on that bag of glass. 
Um, but I mean, I don't think that Trevor's parents were religiously Jewish. Um, culturally, yes. But one thing that's important to say is that they were not into their son marrying somebody who was not Jewish. They just didn't feel like she was really all into the family ideals that Judaism um, supports. And they kind of just felt like Megan was marrying their son to use him for his connections, but that she didn't have any desire to be a wife, to be a mother, to be loyal to his family. They hadn't seen it. How right they were. Um, Tom Bauer says, both Trevor's parents were unhappy that their son was not marrying someone Jewish, and in particular that he was marrying Megan. From their first introduction, both had disliked Megan's aloof self-interest. Over the years, she had shown neither loyalty nor intimacy to the Engelsons. And they just didn't think that she'd be able to make the sacrifices needed to create a family proper home. Yeah, she won't be able to. We'll see that in a hot second. But Trevor just ignored their opposition. Um, you know, he was not a man to necessarily listen to what others thought. After all, he'd given her five minutes. He better give her the next, you know, 50 jillion years. Okay. Now, father's, Trevor's father officiated the, the ceremony. Both of them wrote their own vow, vows. Um, and when it was all over, there was, you know, a roar of approval and the, the party began. Okay, listen to this really crazy, weird behavior of Megan's. This is... Again, she did not want anyone to know that this wedding had taken place. Which is wild to me because it's like, okay, she just goes throughout her life acting like she can just rewrite the things that happened that other people witnessed. No, so she's getting married and all of this, but her intention from day one was not to remain married. And I just, it, it, it shocks me that she, she would even go to the trouble to try to cover up the fact that she was getting married because people are witnessing this. There's 102 people here who see you getting married. Okay, um, so with reggae music in the background, the guests began drinking rum and lager and smoking the cannabis handed out to guests in small bags by the couple. Unnoticed by the guests, Megan demanded the official video of the party. She basically hustles over and demands that whatever has been filmed is handed over. To Thomas Markle's surprise, she destroyed it soon after the wedding. She wanted no visual record of the marriage. By default, only her father's photos have survived. Is that not chilling for Trevor? Here he is getting married, thinking that he's, you know, got this bride that is maybe not real into the idea of settling down now, but she'll get there. You know, she's just trying to settle her career, but she'll get there. I mean, talk about a pipe dream. And meanwhile, she's over here plotting and planning to get out of the marriage literally as the wedding is taking place. I find that incredibly freaky. That is weird. That, that's whack behavior from Meghan Markle. It's scary. Okay. They returned to Los Angeles. Um, they had a small house off Sunset Boulevard. And Suits had done filming their first season. So Meghan was waiting to hear, is it going to be picked up? You know, so she's biding her time with Trevor. Oh, Gotta be a married wife. Gotta be, gotta live in the same house as my husband. So antiquated. But lo and behold, Suits is picked up for a second season. And she celebrated the good news that USA had commissioned a second series by buying herself, now this is in pounds, a 4,800 pound Cartier watch. How much is that in dollars? I don't know. I should look it up. I should look it up before I started, but y'all will tell me. Somebody in the comments, how much is that in dollars? Okay, but this is the thing that is just question mark, question mark, question mark, exclamation point. On the back of the watch, she had engraved 2MM from MM. Why is she in this like love relationship with herself like this? This is so disgusting. I mean, how meaningless. I mean, I know that she's all excited. Like, look what I've become. People always buy themselves watches when they, you know, make it big. So what, as long as she was in Toronto, she just felt like nothing could stop her. She felt really famous and good about herself. But on her return trips to Los Angeles to live with Trevor, Megan realized that her future in Hollywood was bleak. In the world of paparazzi, parties, and producers, she was still unknown and excluded. And Trevor was nothing to write home about either. It's not like he had made big strides in her absence. 
he was still just as unknown as she was. And he wasn't going anywhere. And for Megan to be attached to somebody who wasn't going anywhere while her own star was rising was disgusting. You know, I mean, she's not interested in pulling anybody else up. They need to pull her up. And then once she's there, she'll, you know, kick him back down the ladder. But it just seemed to her that he'd taken her as far as he could. Now, this is also the time when Pretty starts to realize Megan's not the friend she used to be. That at one time, they had been very close. Sisters. She'd been the, her bridesmaid. But y'all at a wedding that Megan did not intend to honor. So it's almost not even a compliment that she asked Pretty to be in it because it was all a farce. But Pretty says, there is Megan before fame and Megan after fame. Unapologetically, Megan started canceling lunches with her old Los Angeles friends at the last moment, explaining how she feared that she'd be recognized. Okay, real quick. I know I keep referencing that Larry King um, interview, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. And if you haven't, you should watch it because it's just, I mean, if you want to. Um, it's just interesting to see Megan trying to portray herself as this sort of sweet, likable person and coming off really just annoying. But one of the things that Larry King asks her is, have you been recognized? Now she and her co-star, both of them jump at the question. Oh yes, yes, we're recognized now. And then Megan tries to kind of overstep and overplay her hand there. And she's like, oh yeah, I mean, like all the time people are noticing us. And then he steps in and he's like, well, I mean, it's not like it's getting to be where we can't live our lives. We're not like, pre we're not like Brad Pitt or anything. We're just, sometimes people will come up and say, you know, thanks for doing the show. So he really sets the record straight. He definitely is not interested in embarrassing themselves by acting like they're more than they are. Not Megan. And later in the interview, she does try to sort of like, like, after absorbing his take on it, then she's got to mirror what he says because that in the moment she realized, oh, that actually does sound better what he said. So then she tries to take his words and make them her own words. But it's very clear that she wanted to believe she was more famous than she was. And of course, we definitely see that when she meets Harry. And all of her life with Harry is then spent trying to prove to the world that they're so put upon by the paparazzi. So this started early. I mean, she loves the idea that she can't live her life because she's so famous. So she starts telling her friends, I can't, I can't meet with you. It's just gonna be really hard. I'm gonna be recognized and it's just not gonna be a fun lunch date. So sorry, I'm gonna have to cancel. And Pretty says that there was a new coolness to her. The tone of her voice, her mannerisms, the way she laughed didn't seem real to me anymore. Her time became increasingly important. When she was in town, she wanted you to drop everything to see her. If I was busy, it would be, why don't you want to see me? I'm here, let's hang out. On other occasions, she refused Pretty's suggestions to meet for lunch. Pretty felt awkward. It was like a light switched off. We began to talk less. I felt if I questioned her behavior, I'd be left on the outside. Fearful for their friendship, Pretty referred, fearful for their friendship, Pretty preferred not to know the truth. Megan had changed. She'd become sharp, clear, and even cruel, even more than ever, her emotions were concealed. And you really see this in that interview. She's not a real person in that interview. Her little twittering and laughing and, you know, even the way she moves her hair away from her face is even, even that is contrived. Like, it's very odd. It's the, it's the strangest movement of her hands. And I, I don't under, it's, it's just very, very, very contrived. And in the interview, I mean, it's an awkward interview anyway. Neither of them are vibing with Larry King. Larry King, I don't feel like is bringing it. It's so, it was hard to get through that interview. But her mannerisms and the way that she is trying to um, build rapport in a very awkward way, just goes to show you she just really wasn't a good actress. But I completely can see what Pretty means when she says the tone of her voice and her man mannerisms, the way she laughed didn't seem real to me anymore. Yeah. If she was getting that Megan from that Larry King interview, she absolutely wasn't a real person anymore. But Trevor had noticed his wife's transformation. She was no longer even sort of the girl that he had met um, and that he thought that he had married. 
Um, during holidays together in New Zealand and Vietnam, his ostensible complaint was serious food poisoning after agreeing with Megan's suggestion that they try the local food. So that was one of the things that marred the vacation. But the real problem on this on these trips, what really was revealed was that at 31, under pressure from Trevor, Megan was thinking of children. And he wanted them, but she didn't. With her career breakthrough, motherhood was impractical. So he'd married her thinking that they were gonna have kids, but I don't know, I mean, she must have said that to him because Nanaki Pretty thought that they were gonna have kids. She said that Megan said she wanted kids with Trevor. So Megan had let him down the garden path on that one. Um, but instead she said, why don't we get a dog to keep me company in Toronto? So they went to Spot Rescue to get a dog. Um, she chose this dog named Bogart, a little six week old yellow Labrador mix. But there was a problem because somebody else already wanted the dog. The same dog had been chosen by someone else. To beat her competitor, Megan recruited Pretty and other friends to bombard the agency in an email chain in her support. The dog, wrote Megan, was guaranteed happiness in the suit's family. I felt that she was playing the suit's card, recalled Pretty, to try to get what she wanted. I felt she had developed a sense of entitlement because she was on the show, and it left a sour taste in my mouth. Yeah, you felt it, because it was there. Megan is entitled. It's all about Megan. Somebody else has already chosen the dog, yet somehow you think that you should have rights to the dog? You weren't there first. But, I mean, she got the dog, so I guess, you know, she may have been playing that suits card, but I guess there were people there willing to accept the card. Well, then, you know, a classic Megan way. Megan goes on to post pictures of the dog. You know, they, they gave the dog to her. She was able to have the dog. And she posted a picture and under it, she tagged Ellen DeGeneres and said, you told me to adopt this sweet pup yesterday and I'm so happy I did. Thanks a million. Dropping names on Instagram obviously was a way to get boost her numbers. And so then she began posting more pictures um, of Bogart the dog and was anointed by Megan as a social media star showered with love. Everybody loved her dog. I've never really gotten into looking at people's pets on social media. To me, that is less than interesting. Bogart became a big thing on her social media and she even went so far as to, and this is very interesting, she had noticed that the royal biographer, Sally Bedell Smith, or her son, had adopted Bogart's brother at the same time that Megan had adopted Bogart. So then Megan goes and emails David to organize a reunion of the puppies on a Malibu beach. And then she made all these Instagram posts about reunited for the first time. And she says that the puppies, you know, romped together for an hour. They were beyond happy. Hashtag puppy love, hashtag Bogart, hashtag rescue pup. You know, she's, she's creating like this, this whole thing about her and the rescue dog. It's just, it, the dog is being used for her. It, she didn't care about rescuing the dog. She just saw it as a way to get more Instagram followers. And can you imagine going through the trouble of finding out who the dog's pup brother had been adopted by? Yeah, I guarantee you she wouldn't have cared if it hadn't been a royal biographer's relative who had, or, you know, adopted the other dog. But, like, who has the time to figure that out and then to arrange for a full hour of standing on the beach, romp, getting your dog to romp with another dog, just taking pictures? Like, I don't, I don't even understand having that kind of a time. I cannot even fathom. She's taking pictures of her dog and hashtag this, hashtag that. She has flown back to Toronto. The show is on. It's airing that night, the second season. Trevor, he's on his own social media. He said, watch Suits tonight. So proud of my amazing wife. He posted this on the 24th of January. And then he went to the Oscars in Los Angeles without Megan. So, you know, as is always customary, everyone's always up on social media bragging about their love and their life and how wonderfully romantic they both of them are only to go on and in their private lives, everything is falling apart. Well, everything was falling apart. And Omid Scobie, Megan's self-styled spokesman, interprets this as a snub. Now, Omid Scobie is a really mysterious character. 
he calls himself a journalist, but he's not. He is a spokesperson for Megan. And critics have highlighted that his face changed after working in Japan for US Weekly and Richard Eden in the Daily Mail, suggested that his age has also been varied. Some say that as a royal editor for Harper's Bazaar, the Anglo-Iranian is a propagandist. Employed by Heat Magazine, he became friends with Dan Wakeford, Wakeford, who had become the editor of People Magazine in 2019. He's treated by some media as the spokesman for Meghan and Harry. So he's not really taken seriously as a journalist. He has been playing his own game of climb the ladder. But Scobie is real hung up on the fact that Meghan wasn't taken to the Oscars by her husband. He brings it up all the time. And according to Scobie, Meghan had always mentioned her dream to go to the Oscars, especially as a star. In reality, okay, it's not Trevor snubbing Meghan. She had refused to join him. Trevor, she knew, was spending every night in bars supposedly to get work. And living apart had really just made them incompatible. Living the dream of Suits' success, she decided that Trevor's demand that they have children didn't match her ambitions. And why should she give him children? Well, I mean, you are married. But it seems like you would have... Well, it's odd to me that you would even get married if you hadn't settled the children question officially. So I could only imagine that Trevor's insistence on having children was him saying, we talked about this already. You know, you said you wanted to have kids and now she's deciding that she doesn't. It's easy enough to say you want to have kids when you aren't already preoccupied with something else. But she told her friends in Toronto that she didn't want children with him. His charm had worn thin. His expectations from their relationship were unacceptable. No one could live with her except on her terms. So, I mean, his expectations from, from their relationship were that she live with him in his home and have children with him. Not wild ex expectations of your bride, but she seemed to think that she was extremely put upon and not just put upon, but that it was almost as though she were being trapped in some kind of abusive relationship that, that he would require that she fulfill the role that he that she had promised before they got married but no it's as though there's a boot on her throat anyway the thing is is that a lot of people who knew trevor weren't super surprised that she had you know was kind of done with him because they said that he was sort of a brash acquired taste but she'd been with the guy for eight years is she only just now realizing, oh, I don't, I don't like the taste you leave in my mouth. You've been with him for quite a while now. Often he acted with self-importance, apparently. And so some people are saying, well, no wonder she didn't like him, but so does she. She had learned a lot from him and his financial support had been invaluable. But the thing is, there wasn't anything left to absorb from Trevor. Nothing more to gain. He had been an opportunity. What he was was a starter marriage. Proof to her that she could capture a man. Now she just had to do it again. She now knew the steps. She'd practiced them and now she wanted to do it again. He was no longer her family. Or it wasn't the latest family that she had. The latest family she had was the Suits family. In this third series of Suits, her fee had been increased to $75,000. The series um, season had been extended to 16 episodes. So her total annual income was now 1.2 million and he he writes in pounds so obviously it was more in dollars for the first time there was the prospect of residuals money listen gave her the right to change her mind and do what she wanted and when all she needed was financial freedom and then it was time to cut ties with trevor where there was money there was no longer duty or obligation so in hindsight we can see that from the get-go, as soon as she had received those rings, she was planning on not keeping them because they had gotten engaged right on the cusp of her moving to Toronto. You know, she was trying to get out of that relationship. She told the producers, uh, it's fine if I can't live with my boyfriend. Then he was the fiance, then he's the husband, but never once in all of that union were they living together under the same roof for any extended period of time. Well, a FedEx envelope was delivered to Trevor's home and what a bombshell it contained. Poor man gets this envelope, opens it up. What is it? Inside was Megan's diamond engagement ring and her wedding ring. And there was no note. 
I mean, that is cold-blooded. I cannot even conceive. Can you imagine? The end of the marriage was in spring 2013, and it came totally out of the blue, according to friends of Trevor's. Trevor was left feeling that he was just a piece of something stuck on the bottom of her shoe, that, she, that he was next to nothing. And what's really interesting is that she was just totally unsentimental about the fact that her eight year relationship had crumbled. It wasn't like this was some guy that she just sort of knew. This was the person she had married. Didn't care, it's over. Kind of out of sight, out of mind, you know. She'd gotten over it a long time ago, and that seems really clear. And another actress, Abby Waffen, who had met her around this time, said that she was really shocked by the way Megan dealt with the divorce, that she herself had been devastated by her own personal divorce. So to watch Megan just sort of skip through the posies like it was nothing was weird. But Megan saw this as an, like she had a sense of empowerment. Life was her own now. She had, didn't have to answer to anyone. She didn't have to deal with any annoying arguments about how she was using her time. She didn't have to be bombarded with the question of children. You know, now she could finally do her own thing, make her own money, make her own way in the world. Splitting from Trevor, Nanaki Pretty realized, showed that Megan was calculating, very calculating, in the way that she handled people and relationships. She's very strategic in the way she cultivated circles of friends. Once she decides that you're not part of her life, she can be very cold. It's this shut down mechanism she has. There's nothing to negotiate. She's made her decision and that's it. No one's feelings but her own matter. Oh, are your feelings hurt? <laughs> Sorry. I'll try to schedule some time to feel bad about that. You know, just really evil. It's evil to treat people like this. And Pretty was, was really hurt by this. And this, consequently, the end of the relationship with Trevor was also the end of Megan's relationship with Nanaki Pretty. And she says that she was shocked by the divorce and tried to, once she had sort of processed that it had happened, she reached out to Megan to find out like, what's going on? Like what, what happened, you know? But Megan would no longer confide in Nanaki. And it was obvious, she says, that we were not friends anymore. She had a new circle of friends and I wasn't in it. Pretty says that the end of our friendship was like a death. I mourned it for quite a while. And she would have, they were like sisters, you know? And to just be cut out like that after, I mean, it's one thing, it's shocking that Megan would just cut Trevor out like it was like he was nothing after they'd been married, they'd been together for almost a decade and suddenly she could just act like it had never happened. But the other thing that's really surprising is that she could cut out Nanaki, who she had known for 30 years, practically. They'd been like best friends for 30 years and it was like just no thing to pretend like Nanaki was nobody. Truly, her moving away was her way of being able to wriggle out from any kind of obligation that relationships in LA would require. Um, Trevor, in his desperation, reached out to Thomas Markle. What is even happening here? And he discovered that Megan hadn't even told her dad that they were separated, getting a divorce, that she'd mailed the rings back. Both men were surprised. Thomas said, I explained to Trevor that Megan's real love was being an actor, probably more than anything else. You marry the business. I keep telling people that I married the business. Megan married the business. That ruins a lot of your relationships. I think what she did was dedicated herself to her show. But what Thomas stopped short of saying to Trevor was, Megan has outgrown you just the way she outgrew me. But Megan, of course, went and confided in the person who was into believing all the BS. Because the thing is, is that Doria doesn't know Megan as well as Thomas knows Megan. So Doria is a lot easier of a person to sort of feed bits of foolishness to. Thomas goes and calls Doria. Did you know that our daughter is divorced from Trevor or is on the way to doing so? Doria's like, oh yeah, Trevor was mean to her. And there was no further explanation except for the fact that he did bad things. What, uh, can we chronicle those? I mean, our daughter is divorcing this man that she's known for eight years. Is there not some background info I could get? No, Trevor was just a bad guy, did bad things. 
And Megan, he thought, was possibly inventing some of these 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 tales of abuse that she had fed to Doria. But the wedding ought to have been proof to him that Megan was definitely capable of telling some lies to get where she needed to go in certain relationships. Because, you know, you'll recall, she had told Trevor, I, you know, I had this terrible home life. Um, and then Thomas and Doria are sitting there in the audience going, wait, what? Terrible childhood, what are you talking about? Um, the Engelson family was less sanguine about the whole thing. They were devastated by Megan's betrayal. Leslie was particularly hurt. Tom Bauer writes, Megan's cold heartedness left both of them deeply unhappy. Their hurt was compounded after Megan posted photos of herself on April 8th at an ice hockey match at the Air Canada Center. She was watching Michael Delzato, a Canadian ice hockey star nine years younger than herself. Yeah. Can you imagine dating somebody 10 years younger than you? Ugh, what would you even talk about? Her affections for Del Zotto, she wrote, were, quote, the best. On 22nd April, she posted more photos of herself watching Del Zotto play at Madison Square Garden in New York. Both would deny a relationship. But Leslie Engelson was not convinced. In their close-knit world, she said daughters-in-law were not unfaithful. The Engelsons blamed Trevor's mistake to marry a girl from a broken family without a common background and no sense of loyalty towards her new family. You know, if she'd only been a nice Jewish girl, perhaps this wouldn't have happened, was kind of their take on the whole thing. Um, but I find it completely disingenuous when people post photos of themselves com very conspicuous with somebody of the opposite sex, rooting them on, making a big show that they're there, and then trying to be like, no, we're just friends. I don't post pictures of me and my just guy friends. Do you know what I'm saying? Like... I, I, that's weird, like, in the context of a group, maybe, but, like, to pointedly, continually to point out, look, it's me and this guy, look, it's me and this guy, look, it's me and this guy. You want us to notice it's you and the guy. And then when we do, no, it's not, stop. Stop being gossipy. No, Megan, you're the one who brought it up. Um, now, Trevor did not feel that he needed to explain himself or his failing relationship. But he did tell a friend, the domestic life with Megan bore no relationship to the demure young woman who fluttered her eyelids on TV. And that marrying her had been a mistake. And that she was mercurial, dramatic, shouty, and difficult. And that she was constantly demanding a role in any of the films that he was producing. And it had been a challenge being married to her. So quite frankly, maybe this was some kind of blessing in disguise. Yeah, and it turns out that it was because he went on to go marry like a billionaire. So I guess he found somebody who could take care of him. Um, the divorce goes ahead, takes place. Um, neither one of them are interested in getting litigious about it. Megan files for a divorce. Two weeks later, papers are served. Neither of them wanted a lawyer. Neither of them needed any financial agreement. I mean, case closed. You go your way, I go mine. Peace be with you. Um, and... To make an estimation, she didn't care if Trevor was hurt. She didn't care if he was disappointed. At 32, she was free. She was free of the baggage of her parents, free of her marriage, free of hustling in Hollywood. Two years later, she would describe her next step. She says, you create the identity you want for yourself, just as my ancestors did when they were given their freedom. I dream pretty big, but truly I had no idea my life could be so awesome. I'm the luckiest girl in the world without question. Okay, well, yeah, you puppet master. I don't know if it's just luck or extreme manipulation. 